Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Hebrew, chapter 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know why he was going or where. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him on the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder was God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he is as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All of these people, when they were living, were living with faith when they died. They did not receive the things they promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. When Linda asked me to pitch it about a month ago, I sort of stumbled with the ball, thought about it a little bit, wasn't quite as confident. But there was so much going on in our world, and so much turmoil, challenges within our country. But I thought, well, if I had a month, at least I had enough opportunity. You know, will there still be those kind of challenges in our news a month from now was my greatest concern. Sure enough, no doubt about that. And the scripture about looking for a better country based upon faith, living our lives in such a way that we may not see in our own time the result of our faith, but that we have faith of what is not seen. It sort of came to me. And I felt that we each have a longing for a better country, a better time. I had have had the good fortune of visiting another country early in my life, which was longing for a better country through generations of oppression. Being in South Africa when apartheid was still the practice. As a 19-year-old college student doing some work for the National Council of Churches, it was an interesting time. And for a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant guy like myself, being thrust into this environment meeting Bishop 
Desmond Tutu, worshiping in an all-black Methodist church, worshiping in an all-white Methodist church. It was an interesting time. And it was obvious that many, despite their racial makeup, was looking for a better country. The post offices in South Africa, all of them, like a lot of the public buildings, had two entrances. And on one entrance was a sign that said, whites only. And on the other entrance, usually near the back of the building, was another sign that said, non-whites only. Non-whites only. That was the distinction that was made. Again, even when worshiping with the all-white Methodist Church, they were looking for a better country. Almost as much as the blacks who I had the opportunity to worship with. An entire segment of their population, a majority of their population, trying to sidestep the conversation about race and oppression and yet still wanting to pray for a better country. They were waiting for a better time. I asked for the song, Sound of Silence, Because one of the things that bothered me recently about our own country was I saw a sign that said in the protests that have been going on, no matter where the protests were, the protests, there was a sign that said, silence is violence. And that bothered me a little bit. That bothered me that, you know, it was sort of, I don't know, conscious raising type. And from that, I sort of came forward with just a few thoughts to share this morning based upon our faith, which calls us to believe in what we may not see. We have spoken about the faith of our church, how we want our place of worship to not only be a place of praise, but a piece of heaven on earth. Are we of faith that there is a place unseen but yet to come? We are also a church of doers. We believe in doing things the intermission missions, the outreach, the Girl Scouts, the soup kitchen, the food bank. We are a faith community who are doers. And the greatest element that I could come to realize based upon our faith of things yet not seen, a calling that I think that we have is that of compassion. While we may seek understanding, while we may seek peace, while we may seek unity, I would submit to you that it is compassion that we are called to give during these struggles within our own country. Right now, there are many physical and political challenges within our own community and our country. And compassion is the message of faith that I think we have been called to share. 
Sometimes that compassion is not seen, and sometimes that compassion is not known. The author of Hebrew, the speaker references past characters in history who have a vision, a faith of future things to come from God, a heavenly place, a better country. We have all heard speakers preach or share thoughts along that. Martin Luther King, perhaps. There's sort of an ironic twist about this book of Hebrew, though. We are not absolutely sure who wrote the book of Hebrew. So here we are being called to have faith of the unseen by an author who is not exactly known. Now, that's a double building of faith. Some people believe Paul wrote it. Some people, it's a little different style than Paul's writings. The letter of Hebrew fills a place in the scripture that both outlines our faith and defines our faith. Much like the book of Romans, which sort of defines the tenements of Christian living. It closes with chapters of faith and serves as a prelude to the chapters of good works built on the foundation of faith in God. In short, this book of Hebrews belongs in the Bible, and then perhaps who the author is is not that important. What is important is that we treat this book of Hebrew as inspired scripture. What is our definition of faith and how do we practice our faith in such a way that we deal with the fact that there are elements which we do not know and do not see? Do we have the faith to believe to carry forth a cause which may not come to fruition within our lifetime? There's a British religious scholar by the name of Karen Armstrong who suggests that compassion is not an emotion. That compassion is really an act, an action. We are a church of doers. We believe in doing things. People want to be religious, Ms. Armstrong suggests, and we should help make religion a force for harmony. She has a TED talk, one of those online talks for the TED community to help build what she calls a charter of compassion, to restore the golden rule as the central global religious doctrine. The charter of compassion is based upon the common historic writings of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Confucius, 500 years before Christ, stated, do not do to others what you would not like to have done to you. St. Augustine stated that we should not leave the interpretation of scriptural texts until we find a compassionate interpretation of scriptural texts. Recently, Pastor Linda shared with us a quote from John Wesley. Do all the good you can in all the ways you can to all the people you can, for as long as you ever can. This concept of compassion being universal has caused this religious scholar, Ms. Armstrong, to approach the United Nations and propose to a committee of the UN 
who believed that the Charter of Compassion would appropriately address extremism to all the member states of the United Nations. Taking that feeling of compassion of the Golden Rule and using it in both the religious and secular sense in this charter that she is proposing in which the UN, at least elements of the United Nations, has agreed to and bought into. It is the understanding of the United Nations Committee that religion is often hijacked by extremists who judge other people by labels or groups. Bishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa, who I actually have the honor of meeting several times, initially when I was in South Africa, is among the many religious scholars supporting this Charter of Compassion. The act, seen or unseen, of compassion is one of the ways that we can move to make a better country. The assembly place, which may may not see within our lifetime, but a place that we can leave. So this morning, I'm asking you to consider your acts of faith, your understanding and compassion as we worship, as we sing, and even as we depart from this place of worship on this fine Sunday morning. We do not need to wait for a declaration from the United Nations. We just need to have the faith that I believe each of us carries within ourselves and not a let allow our silence be seen as violence. Amen. Will you please stand and join us?